I think everybody's heard that phrase, think globally, act locally. And when we enact that phrase, we're often enacting it thinking of the world as this huge planet, right? And that what we do in our own figurative backyard is something that we have power, we are empowered to do, that we have control over, and something that we actually feel as though it's something we can do. We can make a change in our local area and our local changes have, you know, all as, as people do local changes in different places, we all work together and we have a global impact, right? And, and that's a really good and, and good way of thinking of things. But there's another reason to think of the phrase and enact the phrase, think globally, act locally, is that there are actually global forces at work that affect us down to the very local level, whether we're, whether we're talking about our, our tribal governments or we're talking about our municipalities, or we're talking about our township governments, state governments, and of course, national governments. There are forces that are making policy that impact every layer of our political and economic and ecological existence. So when we say think globally, act locally, there's the activism part where you work in your local region and everybody working locally helps make a difference globally. But there's also the idea that there are global forces that we have to be aware of, know that they're gonna impact us locally, and therefore some of us actually do have to get involved at the global level. And those of us working at the local level have to be aware that there's this global arena that is happening that is going to override or supersede whatever we do at the local level unless we are very aware of what is happening at the global level and therefore take action to make sure we protect our local backyard. So let's take a look at some of those policies and practices of the global economic elite. And of course we'll be focusing here on the impacts indigenous peoples have felt as a direct result of this global economic elite because as you take a look, at least since the Industrial Revolution, and particularly since the 1800s, and accelerating since World War II, there has been a growing economic force that operates at the global level and has been an integral part of the colonization of indigenous peoples and lands and has enacted certain policies and practices in order to convert those indigenous peoples and their lands, that is to bring indigenous peoples and their land into the global industrial economy. In other words, to make indigenous peoples and their land productive participants in the global industrial economy. And note that this is a cultural perspective. Um, this is based on the idea, as we shall see, that indigenous subsistence lifestyles, you know, lifestyles are self-sufficient, they're based from the land, are not desirable by this global economic elite. So we'll take a look at what, what are we talking about, these policies and practices. And this is just gonna be an overview. I mean, we could really dig in deep and spend weeks on examining this, but I wanna give you an idea and an overview of what's happening and has been happening. So first and foremost is a really interesting concept to come to grips with that there are actually social engineers whose job it is to take a look at cultures and societies, tilt their head, scrub their chins, whatever, you know, and say, hmm, what sort of changes do we want in the society? Because it isn't quite exactly how we think it ought to be operating. So an anthropological definition of social engineering is forcing change in a culture that is brought on by, surreptitiously by outside agents acting deliberately to change that culture. So notice this is forced change in a culture that's brought on by outside agents who are acting not only deliberately, but surreptitiously, slyly, trying to go undetected to create these changes in a culture. This has been happening with indigenous peoples for a very long time. And I wanna make a note here real quick too, before we get in too far, that as we take a look at these practices and policies that have been directed towards indigenous peoples as part of this colonization process, these same practices and policies of the global economic elite have been applied towards every person, every society and culture who has been um, you know, a culture of the land, people of the land, people who live on the land, whether we consider them native or non-native, have been subjected to these same sort of practices and policies. And I think it becomes really apparent what those practices and policies have been throughout history with civilization, throughout civilization's history, I should say, that is throughout the history of city-based societies, I think it becomes very apparent what those policies and practices have been when we examine the colonization indigenous peoples have experienced in the last couple of hundred years. Okay, so social engineering. 
Uh, social engineering, according to people who do this, is selecting so-called suitable replacement traits. So you take a culture, you decide what you want to change in it, and then you decide what that change should look like how you know what you want to if you're going to take something out of the culture what you're going to replace it with so if you want to get rid of say native spirituality you replace it with christianity which is a cultural paradigm you as a social engineer and the global governing elite or global economic interests are familiar enough with that they understand how to make use of it to achieve their ends, right? You select something out of a culture that you don't have control of or that you don't like, and you replace it with something that you do have an understanding of so that you are able to manipulate that culture better by giving it a handle that you are familiar with. Does this sound crazy? Does this sound nuts? Just think of the Native American boarding schools that they were forced to go to, right? That's one example, and we'll take a look at that actually as an example in a minute. Um, social engineers have talked about taking a look at cultures and needing to, infor to force a wrenching reorientation of values. So when these social engineers were looking at these land-based cultures of indigenous peoples, they said they can't have this attachment to land. They can't have this attachment to self-sufficiency. They have to learn according to these social engineers, how to separate themselves from the land, how to separate themselves from a spiritual connection to the land that they perceive there, as, as the social engineers would see it. And we need to know how, learn how to disconnect them, figure out how to disconnect them from their self-sufficiency from the land. So the things that these indigenous folks value, land, spiritual connection to the land, and you know respect for the land, we need to have a wrenching reorientation of those values. This is what social engineers proposed. This is what social engineers went about doing. Finally, social engineers refer to cultures needing to undergo a wholesale metamorphosis in order to achieve the desired results. So whatever kind of culture you want to see in the end, these social engineers identify this wholesale metamorphosis that the original culture has to go through in order to get to the desired type of culture the social engineers um, are working to achieve, working to obtain. This sounds nuts, right? But this is stuff you can, if you look in particular um, at John Bodley's Victims of Progress, um, he's got really great examples time and time again of where social engineers were actually doing this to different societies. So one example I think of right off the top of my head is in the Soviet Union, they established these, these camps, um, I think they're called red tent camps, and their idea was they would have uh, a local cinema and they'd have kind of fun stuff and it was all this idea that they wanted to get the tribes of the Arctic tribes that were in the Soviet Union, they wanted to convert them to communism and to industrialism. And so they tried to set up these enticing tents to bring people in and show them the so-called comforts of industrial lifestyle. Um, and in this way, try to bring them in to the modern Soviet industrial lifestyle. That was just one example. Um, then we'll talk about many others. But that one way that they try to change these these cultures through social engineering we all experience social engineering in various ways um maybe here in the united states what we are most familiar with is is advertising advertising is a huge example of how people are manipulated in order to achieve desired economic results Self-esteem for social engineers has been a major target um, in various cultures. So what the idea behind the social engineers is that if you target a person's or a people's self-esteem, you know, their self-worth, and you undermine that self-esteem, make them feel that somehow they should be ashamed of who they are, that they aren't good enough as they are, and then you offer a way for them to once again achieve the self-worth that you want them to have, to achieve the self-image that you want them to have, you you say you're not good enough as you are you really should be this way and in order to get this way you have to do this and with advertising it's real obvious as you can see here buy these products and you'll look beautiful right um and if you look at any of these magazines you will find that they're more than 50 to 75 percent filled with ads um and of course there's a whole avenue we could go in there how ad determines ads determine content and all that sort of stuff but the basic idea i want you to get here is that social engineers use a person and a people's self-esteem, their sense of self-worth. They undermine it, they cut it to ribbons, they shred it, they make people feel ashamed of who they are. 
And then they say, this is how you should be. And then they offer ways that people can get to how they should be from what they were. And this is a classic, probably one of the most effective ways to socially engineer culture, make a people feel ashamed of who they are, make them feel backwards, make them feel ignorant, make them feel like they really um, are in need of, of an update, <laughs> essentially. And you can making people feel so bad about who they are, you can then effectively manipulate them to become what you want them to be. And one classic example we have here in the United States is this use of advertisement. In Native American history, the undermining of self-esteem, um, one of the most effective ways that this happened was through schooling, where Native children were forcibly taken away from their families. Over 75% of Native children during this time period, the late 1800s up to the 1970s, over 75% of Native American children um, who attended school attended boarding schools that were, you know, sometimes hundreds and sometimes thousands of miles away from their family, from their culture, from their people. And at these schools, they were made told that they were stupid Indians, that they were ignorant savages, um, that they were backwards, and they were made to feel very, very ashamed of who they are as Native people. In fact, there are so many students I have to this day who will talk about relatives who went to the boarding schools and they'll say, yeah, I know my family is Indian, but my grandma won't talk about it. She says we should be ashamed to be Indian, right? So this, this legacy of shame continues on to this day, people who are alive today and are saying, no, I don't talk about that because that's a shameful thing to be. So these schools, they're taking kids, little kids, right? They could be anywhere from five to six years old and they kept them in the schools until they were 18 and inculcating into them that they are not good enough as native people, but the way they can earn the respect of their teachers and their you know, headmasters of the school and you know, of society in general is to become, like you see, on the right there, you know, to become uh, an image of, uh, come to, to reshape yourself in the image of the white culture, of the settler culture. And then the idea was, then you'll be given respect. And of course, that, you know, we know where that, that story goes to, having to confront a society of racism. But the idea here is that the undermining of self-esteem was used to make people ashamed of themselves, kids in particular here, and then offering them an image that they should strive for in order to regain their self-respect. At least that was what was promoted. And then you offer them avenues to get to the desired change that you as a social change agent want to have happen among that person and among a people as a whole. This is all part of social engineering. Um, so social engineering, I, I, there's so many other different ways that people went about it. But schooling has been one of the most effective ways that you could possibly go about it. Uh, Russell Means in an essay um, that he wrote, uh, Marxism is as alien to my culture as capitalism. He even asks, he says, Native, this is back in the 1970s, I believe, 1980s. He says, I'm, he says, I'm worried about the Native people who are even attending our universities. He says, it's going to be so difficult to hold on to your cultural values. Um, so even at university levels, it can be difficult if you're in not a uh, culturally empowering place, difficult to retain who you are. And there are a lot of pressures from that settler society to change who you are, everything from being ashamed to um, of, of having family connections, right? Um, maybe you are living at home um, and you're, and the idea in college is so often put out there that you should be separating from your home. You should be separating from your family. That goes contrary to tribal ideas and tribal, traditional tribal lifestyles. There's so many just different ways that even post-secondary educations like universities to this day make people, undermine people's sense of cultural self if you're coming from a more traditional indigenous family, right? There's just so many ways, um, you're somebody who cares about animals, but you're very interested in them and you end up going into biology, Western biology. Um, there are so many people who come out of that just, just scarred or leaving the field because they want to learn about animals, but they are forced to do things to animals that go very contrary to who they are as a native person and trying to practice traditional values and stay true to traditional values. But schooling says, well, you want a job in this field and you better learn how to just suck it up and push on through those, those 
um, that that horror you have at violating these principles and values that you hold very dear about how you treat our animal relatives. So again, universities are just as guilty to this day of undermining Native people's self-esteem in order to train them to their chosen professions, right? So this is something that has not gone away. So social engineering, schooling being the most effective, television extremely effective, advertisement extremely effective, all of these work very well together to undermine people's sense of self-confidence and thus then to make them more malleable and able to be manipulated into the desired end product of what kind of person the social engineers want these people to be.